between Reed and others in many instances is attitude. When the chips are down, we don't care what the odds are. When the chips are down, we don't care what the odds are. We know we're there to win and we're going to ex exercise every mental, physical capability we have to make it come true. And we do. Uh, at the Iwo Jima invasion. I am a small boat coxswain. I run the troops in. I run the 4th Marines in. Maybe some of the 5th. It got confusing after a while. Uh, I went in on Yellow Beach, supposedly. I took the third wave in. And you uh, historians know more about it than I do. I'm serious. When I went in, it was so much clutter on there, I couldn't hardly get in. So I don't know where exactly I landed. But that's when all hell broke loose, the third wave. Our outfit was there to uh, try to create uh, some kind of landing harbor uh, to make it facilitate unloading uh, uh, supplies. But the island is a uh, not very hospitable for that sort of thing. And uh, I think I landed about uh, an hour after each hour. And as I was going to shore, I was sitting on a bunch of uh, uh, communication equipment, and I could see uh, kind of what was happening. And uh, I, I thought, boy, we were really giving them hell. There are shells exploding all over the place. We got a little closer, and I saw that it wasn't our shells that was exploding on the place, it was Japanese shells. And uh, my attitude changed. I thought the whole world was happening at that time. that the fella put on the screen was a lot of those places that I recognize and I remember being there. Uh, I was wounded a couple of times. I never did leave the front line. Uh, I got a purple heart, but I don't really think I deserve it. I remember a lot of the stuff that happened and a lot of it I've forgotten and I've tried to forget. 24th was in, uh, in reserve and uh, we were committed kind of late in the afternoon uh, on D-Day. And uh, we formed a wave and started in. And uh, we caught a round of artillery between us and the beach. And so uh, the coxswain, a couple of the boats, the guys cut the power, started to drift a little bit. And the boat next to us, the guys got anxious and uh, dropped the ramp before they before they got to the beach. And that boat turned into a submarine. And uh, it, all the guys, in the, I remember looking very clear there, everybody threw off everything they had there. Helmets, packs, right over there and swam ashore. And here these, of course we didn't know what we were facing, but anyhow, they went into one of the worst battles the Marines ever had. Soaking wet with absolutely no equipment, nothing. Right? Over the years I've got for those poor guys. I think I might be the only person who served on, on land in Guam's invasion, Hallelujah's invasion, and Iwo Jima's invasion. Let me say a little bit more about the, the beach. Uh, it was littered with wounded and dead and body parts, and I was, uh, didn't know what to do, to tell you the truth. Uh, I made it all right, but I went in as a young kid, you might say, but it didn't take you long to grow up and become a man. Uh, I had a lot of friends to get killed, and uh, 
I, I've seen the time that I, I didn't think I had much of a chance either. But anyway, I made it through, and uh, I'm thankful I did. Incredible. We're standing here today, having them through the most vicious, bloodiest battle of World War II, and I'm still here today to talk about it. And I know that I'm amongst the world's luckiest men, and I'm proud of that, and I'm proud of my fellow survivors of them all. Yes, he joined the Marine Corps in 1943, August, and he said that he wanted to do his part the war effort, and if he was going to get in service, if he was going to die, he wanted to go out with the best. So he said, that's the Marines. So suddenly he heard the battle going on. His, his outfit was there fighting, and he had this overwhelming feeling of guilt and pride. Went to Guam and uh, came here and was assigned to 20th Air Force headquarters. And this airport at that time was Harmon Field, with an air base. Uh, I was assigned to 20th Air Force headquarters and I went from there to the Union. Spent a year up there and came back. volcanic ash berm like that. And my own tractor got halfway up the berm and I tracked the ground around to halt. It couldn't handle the black sands of Iwo Jima. But on the battlefield, it's a classic saying that the one that gets you, you never hear. And I didn't hear the one that got me. And a spring of water landed from bush down there about 50 or 60 yards and I got a multiple blast of shrap, tiny shrapnel that went between my helmet and my uh, utility jacket and my hands were exposed so they were full of fragments. And... But the point is that uh, when they, I was evacuated to the beach and evacuated to the hospital ship, the Good Samaritan. I was evacuated to Guam where I stayed overnight. The nurses on the hospital ship had cleaned me up as we were going to Guam. And I said to a nurse, who turned out to be a graduate of my school, University of Virginia, I said, you know, I don't think I'm hurt very bad. She said, well, you got a lot of little things in you. bled a lot. But uh, if you think you're up to it, if you want to go back, you have to fight for it, because they're not letting anybody I told Colonel James that I wanted to go back, but I didn't think I was wounded enough to get out of the fight. I told him that the Marines up there on Okinawa were my family. I've been away from my wife and my son for a year and a half, but then a year and a half I had that chow, Reveille, softball, beer, you name it, we did it together. We were bonded. And besides that, by the time we got to Iwo, uh, we had the 4th Division that fought at Roy Namor, that fought Saipan and Tinian, so we were totally bonded 
young Marines. Uh, young Marines, I was 23. My troops were 17, 18, 19. right to my company the same afternoon or the next day. Another mortar came in and blew out my ear. <laughs> I couldn't hear. But I was only evacuated overnight. Uh, I was evacuated to my regiment A station, which is a matter of hundreds of yards back. And by the next night I could hear again, so I went back to my company and stayed with them until we finished uh, after 36 days of fighting. Now the next time we know about Boots, he's in the 5th Marine Division. He's at the base of Mount Suribachi. He's calling for fire support against a heavy bunker position up at the base. And uh, for that, he exposed himself repeatedly and won the Navy Cross, which was awarded posthumously. That kind of jumps ahead of the story. But he was one of the first in the patrol up Suribachi. He found the water pipe that was used to as the flag boat. He was not he was in the picture of the first flag raising, but not the second. There were two or three uh, combat uh, reporters. One of them said to Boots, Boots, how is it really in there? And Boots said, It's held in there. And he said, My next birthday will be my twenty first birthday next week, and I don't expect to make it. And the fact of life is Boots didn't make it. Two days before his 21st birthday, he was down on one knee on the ground, leading his uh, patrol. He had his rifle in this hand, his radio in this hand. A sniper bullet knocked the rifle out of his hand, but Boots never stopped talking. 30 seconds later, he's on the radio and a sniper bullet came out of it. So Boots went home to God. Now the point in that story is, that we know what tremendous potential Boots Thomas had in him as a young man in his community. And when we lose a guy like that in battle, we lose all that potential for leadership in his community, his state, and indeed for our nation. So I, I tell that story most times to make the point that I hope my great-grandchildren and their peers, their generations, can find a way to solve some of these international differences without going to violence and warfare that we knew on an island like this. My most effective weapon on this island was the heart and soul of the young Marine who faced tremendous odds every day and didn't let that bother him. All he knew was, we're going to try again today to do better than we did yesterday. COC, COC, this is Big Ford departing ROE. We're out to Sarabazzi.